Good morning and welcome to this service of worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Gastonia. Uh, remotely, of course, it's good to have you with us this morning. We pray God's blessings on you as always and we do pray that you are healthy and well in your homes. I assume since you are watching this morning that you are connected electronically and so I would invite you to be sure and go to the church's website which is fpcgastonia.org and make sure that you uh, check out the bulletin and the announcements so that you will know about the life and ministry of this congregation. Uh, just because we are living and working remotely, it doesn't mean that God's work does not continue. So please be sure that you are aware of the things that are coming up in the near future. We thank you for being with us this morning. And as we here at First Presbyterian uh, proclaim ever so often, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let us worship God together.
Brothers and sisters, let us open our hearts and minds in one accord to worship the living God, no matter where you may be this day. Jesus reminds us that where two or three are gathered, even over a video worship experience, we are together and we are gathered in the name of God. Brothers and sisters, let us worship together. We begin our worship by getting the hard stuff over with first. Let's do the heavy lifting first as we own, as we name, claim, and accept our sins, our failures, our regrets, and the ways in which we bear shame. Brothers and sisters, let us unload all of that to a loving and merciful God who will pick it up for us, who will offer grace and relieve us of our burdens and give us a steadfast love that will never end. Brothers and sisters, let us pray together, followed by your own time of silent confession, knowing that God hears, God responds, and God loves us. Let us pray together. In humility, Lord, we must confess how we have not matured as your children, even as extra time presents itself. The hurting and helpless of our world cry out, and we cover our ears and focus on tending to our own selves. The forsaken and forgotten of our community are desperately seeking a word of hope. And sometimes, even in our prosperity, we find that word hard to articulate. Those filled with loneliness and lament continue to grieve, but we are so distracted by our own resentment over unwanted circumstances that we neglect to share gentle songs of grace with them. O oh God of refuge for the broken, forgive us. Our times are in your hands, so help us to believe we can be healed in this moment. Transform our hearts now, O oh God, that we might lovingly serve your children. Grant us such joy in the life and resurrection of Jesus that faithful service in your name is all we seek. And all God's people said together, Amen. Brothers and sisters, the depth of God's love for us is something we cannot even fathom. And God will go deep to pick us up, to claim us, and lift us up onto the solid ground that God knows we can live into. Friends, know that you are forgiven. May this bring you great peace. And may it set you aright with joy in your journey of discipleship. Brothers and sisters, know that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray for the Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you would pour out a full measure of your spirit upon us as we prepare to open our hearts and minds to hear that which you say to us today. Silence in us any voice but your own. May we hear what you say to us today and respond with joy as we seek to be your faithful disciples in this time and in this place. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Friends, our first scripture lesson today is from Psalm 31. This is a psalm of deliverance. We will hear together verses 1 through 5 and pick up at verses 15 and 16. Listen for God's word to you today. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. 
In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Friends, may God bless the reading of this holy word. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of 1 Peter, and it was written to those having oversight of the churches in Asia Minor. These words were written at a time and in a place where the name Christian was offensive to non-believers, and Christians could expect things like uh, name-calling and social ostracism, even persecution, because they lived their lives in a way that rejected the um, pagan culture to which they had previously belonged. And in fact, God chose Christ to be the cornerstone of the new temple, and now the Christians are considered a new race, Gentiles, who were indeed God's people. So let us listen now for God's word as it comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into spiritual a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, according to our Savior Jesus, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will never pass away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is May the 10th, the fifth Sunday in Easter, Nine weeks since we last worshipped physically together. A situation we surely all lament. And yet, and yet, I continue to be flabbergasted by the ways in which Scripture speaks to us so vividly and in such a timely manner. But then I have also come to understand that God is in the flabbergasting business. During Eastertide, there's a certain amount of abnormality. 
Because even though Jesus has risen from the dead, as he said, the Holy Spirit has yet to make her appearance and it's still more waiting and uncertainty. Our world is currently filled with both mystery and misery, and yet we are not so far removed from the ancestors of our faith who also experienced times of lament and mystery and misery. I have to say, the connections to our past, to the great pioneers and proclaimers of the faith of Jesus Christ, are something of a launch pad for all of whatever may come next. So this morning, I begin with a word of hope. We are by no means isolated by our struggles. God is by no means indifferent to our sufferings, and we remain fully convicted by the power of the resurrection. Thanks be to God. Now, our first passage from Psalm 31 is recognized as a prayer for deliverance from personal enemies. I find this relevant even today as I wonder, do any among us have personal enemies? Perhaps a lost job or trying to keep a business afloat and working a bajillion hours a week? Perhaps loneliness or a fragile body or a mind or spirit that is burdened, possibly overwhelmed by a beast of a virus or its downstream effects? Many of us feel heavy right now, if not for ourselves, then certainly for others. We have a fitting psalm this morning that, in good psalm writing fashion, begins with the principal elements of lament. But rather than the typical more modern, oh, woe is me, the words enlighten us to the faith of the lamenter, even in the midst of his despair. And isn't that a fascinating way to begin a lament? In these seven short verses, there are about 20 verbs with such hopeful sentiments as deliver me, incline your ear, rescue me, save me, lead and guide me. You are my refuge. You have redeemed me. And then moving into these words of confidence, my time is in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. We don't know the time or the place or the nature of the trials referred to by this psalm writer, but I suspect we share some things in common, and that is that we all want safe space, refuge, and relief when so much around us feels threatening. As I see it, there's an interesting thread connecting the psalmist and the pep talk that's in first Peter between, and then also between them and us. Just as our forebears of centuries and centuries ago, we have a foundation that is made solid by our faith, which then provides sustenance for whatever the journey may be. Our identity as children of God doesn't just shrivel up at the first sign of hardship. Yeah, sure, we get discouraged or angry or uh, frustrated or scared. But First Peter seems to insist that the Christian life particularly equips believers with all they need. 
to take one more step, to endure one more knock, to go one more mile. Nowhere, scripturally or anywhere else, are we promised easy. But we are decked out with every gift we need to proclaim the love and the mighty acts of the one who calls us out of whatever the darkness may be, the one who delivers us into the light, a light for which we give thanks and celebrate. Now, as we shift a little more fully into the first Peter text, it feels as if that darkness has lifted a little more and we're a little more fully in the light, a glorious place on my dad. Our footing is more solid with Jesus as the cornerstone of our spiritual house. Now, for those such as myself who have zero construction experience, it is imperative to understand the metaphor of Jesus as cornerstone in order to get the full impact of its meaning. Simply stated, the cornerstone of a building is placed at an angle where two walls meet, binding them together and giving the structure stability. The cornerstone is fundamental in the construction and indispensable in terms of reinforcement. This too is what Jesus is for us, fundamental and indispensable, and sealing the deal, chosen and precious in God's sight. So when we are instructed to let ourselves be built into a spiritual house, I think it is both literal and metaphorical, and oddly enough, for the same reasons. We know that much of scripture requires a certain amount of interpretation because of the allegories and the analogies and the parables and the metaphors. Hearing this or exhortation in 1 Peter today that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, well, it comes across as somewhat metaphorical and pretty spectacular, uh, even fantastical, a little bit remote from reality. But paying attention to that last one in particular, God's own people. We must know that we have been set aside by God's grace and we have been set aside for God's purposes. As a royal priesthood or what you oftentimes hear referred to as priesthood of believers, we are a holy nation, um, not in the literal sense uh, in terms of geography, but a common bond, and because we are identified as a holy nation, we are compelled to be God's agents in the world. Now, hearing that may sound huh, like a little bit much, especially now, especially at a time when for many of us, our get up and go has gotten up and gone. Having said that, though, I need to share an observation with you. You who are literally a royal priesthood and a holy nation of God's people. In this time of mystery and misery and darkness for many, I cannot even count the many, many ways that you as God's people have participated in providing food and toiletries and shelter for God's people, for the ways in which you have sent prayers and cards and letters and emails and made calls of love and encouragement and kindnesses beyond measure. 
you are literally proclaiming in very real ways the mighty acts of God who has called you out of the darkness. It reminds me very much of Peter's word, Paul's words, excuse me, to the Colossians, where he said, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So friends, here these weeks after Easter when the blooms have fallen from the lilies and when most but not all of the, of the alleluias have been tucked away, my prayer is that you will seek refuge in the Lord, our rock and fortress. You will be filled for the journey by the unadulterated nourishment of the gospel, our spiritual milk, and that you will live your lives as the chosen and called children of God. We may be mostly sequestered at home, but the work of God's people continues. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thanks be to God for the work we've been given. Thanks be to God for the equipped believers who carry it out. Thanks be to God for his great mercies. Thanks be to God for calling us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Steadfast and loving God, you who are our refuge in times of trouble and our shelter when we are afraid, in you alone we trust. In you we see our way forward and discover what is authentic. In you we find abundant life. And so we offer you our worship and love as the God who creates and gives life to the world, as the Son who came, that we might have light and life abundantly. God of power and might, who raised Jesus from the dead, you free our hearts from darkness. We thank you for your peace, which we need so desperately these days. In Christ we know you as the way. You deliver all who turn to you in moments of challenge or uncertainty. We pray for those who feel lost or alone, those who live with great anxiety and doubt, and any who are fearful of what tomorrow might bring. We pray that you will open the eyes of those who are struggling so that they can see that there is a new way filled with hope for them with the promise of rest and renewal. In Christ, we know you as the truth. You reveal the falsehood and lies that ensnare us in these confusing times. We pray for those who have put their faith in false hope and flimsy promises, those who are deceived by the fabrications of the power-hungry, and any who are misled by distortions and twisted claims that circulate each day. God of the truth, reveal the shallowness of things that distract or mislead us and empower us to see what is true. You promise to overcome all that is rooted in death and decay by your resurrecting power. 
We pray for people who struggle with illness or grief and all who live with deep sadness, depression, or hopelessness. We pray for those for whom each day seems a chore and those for whom opportunities for abundant life are cut down by acts of discrimination or the loss of what seemed like security just weeks ago. God of all life and each life, heal those who are suffering and make your justice known in our land. Inspire each of us and your whole church to follow in the footsteps of Christ so that in our living and loving, your kingdom of justice and love is revealed. These things and all things we pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today, it being the second Sunday uh, of the month, is our nickel a meal, our five cents a meal collection. The five cents a meal is dedicated to the feeding of the hungry in Western North Carolina. You may give online by clicking on our the church website, www.fpcgastonia.org. That is www.fpcgastonia.org. And when you get to the website, click on Online Giving. While the season is the season of Easter unfolds, the gifts of spring also remind us of God's generosity, God's generosity in Jesus Christ and in all of our creation. As we present our gifts this morning, may our generosity reflect God's goodness to us and the hope of abundant life in Jesus Christ. We do remember the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Our gracious God, loving Father, generous God, we bless you for your gift of life renewed through Christ's love and through springtime growth in fields and gardens. Bless these gifts we bring to you. May they offer a hope and renewal in the world you love as we serve in the name of your greatest gift, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
And now, brothers and sisters, as we go from our living room to the kitchen to the den and back again, go knowing that God's work continues. Thanks be to God for the work we've been given. Thanks be to God that we have been equipped as believers to do that work. So go in peace. Go in spirit to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, be and abide with you all, now and forever and ever. Amen.